Hello, my name is Dr. Lauren England. I'm presenting a paper as part of the first PhD and Early Career Researchers Annual Online Conference, Exploring Creative Economies in Africa, Definitions, Frameworks and Impact. The paper that was presented is Tensions and Duality in Developing a Circular Fashion Economy in Kenya. This research was conducted by myself, my colleagues, Dr. Eka Igpe and Professor Roberta Communion, all from King's College London. The structure of the presentation is first a brief presentation of the associated literature, focusing on issues around global tensions in circular fashion in Africa, and drawing on the, the theoretical perspective of more than local perspectives on sustainable fashion. Let's provide some context on secondhand clothing market and export processing zones or EPZs in Kenya as a key context for our research. I then briefly introduce the methods and our research with fashion designers based in Nairobi before presenting the findings, focusing on three key areas. Firstly, the circular traditions and contemporary adaptations of fashion designers in Kenya. Secondly, their relationship with secondhand clothing. And finally, the relationship with the export processing zones, EPZs. The final discussion and conclusions highlights the tensions and duality between the global and local circular fashion economy dynamics. So to start off with, just to situate ourselves in the literature, thinking about the global tensions that arise in this idea of circular fashion in the African context. We know that the global fashion industry currently follows a, a very linear take make waste economy model. So very much in an antithesis to that circular economy model. And it's very much implicated in environmental degradation and the exploitation of social uh, groups and communities, so having both the social and economic impact and the environmental impact as well. The circular economy, in contrast, is positioned as an alternative industrial system. It's very much an aspirational model, but we find that in the literature and industry debates that the African perspective remains very limited in this context, and especially in the industry uh, perspective of fashion. The circular economy as a concept is also often conceptualized as a global north innovation, which overlooks similar contexts, concepts that have already been embedded in global south practices. And the fast fashion industry's extractive growth model, the subsequent secondhand clothing market, as we discuss later on, arguably perpetuates inequality and poverty through setting up unequal patterns of commodity exchange. We explore how this develops new forms of waste colonialism that emerge in the revaluing of wastes in this context, unwanted secondhand garments, and that these are generated by countries in a more powerful positioning, often found in the global north, uh, in these that these are countries in a higher position in global production and value chains that are then exporting these uh, garments to Africa. In adopting a more than local perspective, this is an idea that moves towards scholarly decolonization and non Eurocentric approaches in fashion studies. So we're building on this literature and adding to also wider calls to deprovincialize knowledge and ideas from African contexts. Rimi Khan's notion of more than local considers relations of difference and a focus on inequality here to consider the complex, asymmetrical and often hierarchical international relationships and wider processes of intercultural exchange in considering sustainable fashion development specifically. And we find that this approach, this more than local perspective, enables an exploration of how the local and global reality of the circular economy are continuously renegotiated in place. To provide some context, a uh, key focus for our papers, looking at the secondhand clothing market and export processing zones in Kenya, so in 2021, Kenya was the second largest African and fifth largest global importer of secondhand garments, totaling 169 million US dollars equivalent. Historically, the garments that have been coming into Kenya have come from the USA, the UK, and also a few European countries. But we are seeing a rapid shift towards China as one of the largest contributors of exporters. The literature and, and industry debates have, have presented an idea that there is a creative place for secondhand imported garments, also known as matumba in Kenya, through practices such as circular thrifting or upcycling practices. There is also an economic role that these, these play in terms of having a, a market, a very sort of affordable market for clothing. 
And we see an influence, both cultural and economic, of past colonial presence and contemporary political agreements on market development, political agreements, particularly the African Growth Opportunity Act or AGOA, and we'll explore that a bit later on. Export processing zones or EPZs are an investment, represent an investment in textiles and garment industries in Kenya since the 1990s to support economic development. So garment factories in export processing zones are often established to drive economic development, to, to generate jobs in partnership with international investors. There is very much a focus, as the literature highlights, as a, a servicing of global mass manufacturing companies in these EPZs as global fashion companies have moved their production into Africa and Kenya specifically in search of low cost inputs, tax breaks, tariff free locations and proximity to European markets. What we find in these EPZs and the garment manufacturing uh, factories is that there is a privileging of basic skills development and lower value adding activities such as cut, make and trim over a higher value fashion design, production, education and training. So we can see this as having, in some ways, a, a negative impact on the local market and production capabilities. So moving to our own work, the methodology that we adopted was a primarily quite qualitative uh, methodology involving interviews with 14 designers from Nairobi that were conducted between 2020 and 2021. We also conducted three online group discussions with Kenyan fashion designers and industry stakeholders in 2022. And here we take the perspective of fashion designers as key actors who are able to reflect both on their everyday practices of, of production, of sourcing, of distributing, marketing their, gar their clothes and their brand, and also to reflect on the policies and market dynamics that affect their work. We conducted a thematic analysis of the interview data and our codes were covering aspects such as local cultures, local relationships and resources, local politics, population dynamics, market dynamics, both local and global. Considering in particular the more than local perspective, looking at issues around relational inequality, hierarchies, international policy and the role of place as well. Uh, this is a, an overview of our 14 designer interviewees to showcase uh, that they come from a range of different kind of educational backgrounds ranging from they're all reasonably highly educated as a sample, uh, both male and female participants uh, engaging in a range of different types of fashion production from custom made to small batch ready to wear, um, occasion wear, men's wear, women's wear, children's wear. Um, and so we can see a sort of a range of practices uh, exemplified here. So our first aspect of the findings is to look at the ways in which these designers uh, approach the idea of circular fashion um, and how this was very much Im embedded in their, their creative practices and in their production practices and business models as well. And we see this in the ways in which the fashion designers adopted multiple creative and entrepreneurial strategies of circularity and waste reduction. And interesting, what we what we highlighted was from this discussion, the interviews that we had was that these practices were very strongly connected with cultural traditions. A lot of designers um, you know, reflected that this was part of their culture to, to reuse waste, to, to not generate waste or surplus in the first place. Uh, sort of being in contrast to the, the mainstream global more fashion uh, model. A number of designers also expressed a desire to produce more sustainably, but they felt limited by the local infrastructure and resource availability. In this sense, the local cultural foundations for sustainable or circular fashion were placed directly in tension with global market forces. It's going to be a sense of some of the strategies that were adopted uh, there was an emphasis on, on quality over fast fashion, of small batch production, of also of designing classic trend, classic designs rather than sort of fast paced uh, turnover of trend based garments. Adopting a made to order uh, approach, uh, generating a number of samples that could then be customised, but that there was, you know, they're not produce, over producing garments are so reducing waste in that way. Other designers creatively were upcycling scrap materials, donating offcuts of their own production, offering free repairs or so a service-based model so to extend the life of their garments. In some cases also upcycling secondhand garments 
uh, into new materials. So not just upcycling the, the garment itself, but taking uh, a range of garments and, and taking them apart and re reformulating them into a new material. Uh, the designers have got in these quotes uh, are highlighting that tension between the first world dumping their fast fashion in the country, that this that fast fashion sort of culturally isn't isn't a local problem, that it's an inherited one, um, and that these designers are then working from that excess. They're trying to fix uh, an environmental and, and sort of uh, social problem uh, by developing their own creative adaptations to that. So we, we highlight these sort of local global tensions emerging in that sense. To move on to the area of secondhand clothing, we noted that the designers both saw advantages and disadvantages of secondhand clothing in relation to circularity and how this was adopted into their practices, as we mentioned, embedding that in some of their creative and business models uh, in some cases, but also highlighting some of the geopolitical tensions that arise, particularly regarding international trade agreements such as the African Growth Opportunity Act or AGOA, which mandates that um, the African countries, including Kenya, participating in AGOA must receive the uh, imported secondhand garments from the USA in order to gain access to preferential trade agree the preferential trade agreements to export other goods. Um, so in terms of the secondhand market, the advantages that came up in terms of thinking of the secondhand market as pro-circular economy is that firstly, it does provide an affordable source of, of clothing for lower socioeconomic goods groups. It provides the designers or thrifters also with a source of goods for resale. So it provides a sort of uh, an additional kind of economic um, market there. For the designers, it also provides them with potentially a source of materials to upcycle into new garments or in case, some cases materials, as I previously mentioned. And many designers did know that they actually didn't see a huge amount of competition with their own design practice, particularly those that were aiming at a higher value uh, kind of group or a more luxury market. Um, as the designer quoted here says, I know that people say if you ban Mitumba, lo local designers will thrive. I'm not sure that will happen. We serve very different needs. I think there's enough for everyone at the moment. So reflecting on our degree of market segmentation there. In terms of the disadvantages they highlight, they were mostly focusing on the, the, lack, the low quality and very high quantity of garments. Um, particularly in, interesting here is that the low, the, the low quality and, or, and also historically kind of reducing quality of the secondhand garments that were coming into the country was associated both with the rise of more sustainable consumption in the global north. So the, what it appears is that the sort of exporting countries are actually keeping the higher value items domestically, using them in, they're being resold locally, whether that's through local charity shops or uh, through online resale platforms. Um, and that it's now a lower quality of garment that is being exported as a result of that, and also associated with the rise of fast fashion uh, and the um, exponential growth of, of fashion production in, in China. Uh, many of these uh, very low quality garments were things being unfit to be used and therefore going into landfill, having an environmental cost. In some cases, the designers uh, highlighted that the because of uh, tariffs placed uh, by the government on secondhand garments to try and limit the importation, uh, that they were in some cases now higher priced than new virgin garments that were being imported from China that were extremely low cost, but also extremely low quality. Designers also did note some, some did see there being a degree of market competition in terms of the perception of the value of a higher priced garment compared to one that could be sourced from the second hand market. Um, and, and the designer quoted here is, is reflecting uh, on the, the perceived sort of reduction in quality of secondhand garments that are coming in. They say that the, qu the quality of the clothes that we're receiving in Matumba has just re really drastically gone down just because the Western countries have now started this whole circular economy, you know, sustainability drive. Now they pick out the best clothes and they don't ship them to Africa in the way they used to. So here we can see a direct tension of this drive for a circular economy uh, in the global north directly impacting uh, the, the quality of, of garments that are being exported into Africa and then dealt with uh, locally. 
Our second uh, area is looking at export processing zones, which are in some ways perhaps seen as the antithesis to the circular economy in that these are export processing um, uh, factories based on large scale manufacturing, often servicing fast fashion com com companies. So we see this as part of a perpetual growth model and unsustainable fashion consumption that feeds landfills and supports that fast fashion system. But in the local context, we do also see there being key opportunities for Kenya and other African nations to take an alternative approach to existing unsustainable models and thinking about how perhaps these, these factories are regulated, the policies that are used to support them. Uh, and the designers did express a real desire for sustainable and ethical manufacturing to become embedded in Kenya's development strategy for this to be very much central to, to the development of sort of the economic trade policies that surround these EPZs. Uh, and also to consider um, how education can support um, higher value manufacturing, uh, both for current and future generations of designers. So the advantages and disadvantages as articulated by the designers, firstly, the advantages were that the EPZ do create localised textile waste loops. Uh, so the waste um, or offcut or dead stock fabric can be purchased at an affordable uh, rate by designers to use in their own um, their own production. So this is both an affordable and consistent source of, uh, of inputs for the designers. Uh, and the, the quote below is where a designer is reflecting on how they can get waste produce from the EPZ manufacturing company. So this becomes a, a sustainable way of purchasing fabric. The disadvantages that they highlighted firstly was that prioritization of foreign lead firm interests inhibiting high value domestic production. It was noted that there used to be a policy or a strategy where the designers could access EPZ facilities to upscale their own production capabilities, but that that, um, that access was no longer uh, available um, or it wasn't available at the reduced rate it was initially offered at. And so it became prohibitive in terms of accessing that larger scale manufacturing capability. They also highlighted uh, see the, the environmental and social impact of mass produced fashion. So overall, what, what we are highlighting uh, through our research is both these, these tensions and duality that emerge between the global market perspective and the African designer perspective that relates to both the concept of the circular economy and the, the, uh, the, the market and uh, social dynamics around secondhand clothing and EPZ manufacturing. Here, the global market perspective as we're presenting it represents the positioning of, of the circular economy, secondhand clothing and EPZs in relation to international fashion market development. Whereas the African designer perspective that we present in the figure uh, is based on our empirical work. And what we've sought to draw out in this figure is some of the, the correlation between the two perspectives, but also where there are divergences in position and nuanced perspectives that we can draw out from the local designers. So for example, thinking about the circular economy from a global market perspective, seeing if this is a response to global crisis, still being very economic value driven in terms of this is a new economic system that, that can revalue waste, um, it can create added value so for sustainable goods, whilst also addressing economic and environmental challenges. Whilst if from the African designers perspective, we saw that this was a very long established sort of knowledge system. Uh, it has both economic and cultural value uh, embedded in its practices that this is, this is you know, not a new concept uh, for these designers, it was it's an, a way that can be used to avoid waste, creating garments uh, that, that very much last, that can be passed on. So we see a lot of circular practices being adopted, but they're not necessarily referred to as circular by the designers that we interviewed. From the secondhand clothing market, where we're seeing both positive and negatives um, on both sides, seeing from the global market perspective that these secondhand garments are that this is a way of, of keeping garments in the loop of giving them a second life that there's a very much association with the charitable charitable model here but it's a huge market um, so we are seeing the issues around sort of negative uh, impacts in front of waste garments uh, and the economic power hierarchies that come through here being acknowledged by by some um some in sort of coming from this perspective 
And in the Kenyan, the African designer perspective, understanding the, the positives in terms of the variety and circularity of inputs, both for, for textiles, accessories, the potential to, to recreate something from these garments and also acknowledging their lower costs and accessibility. Um, highlighting here the, the local dynamics of the fact that these garments can push down prices to so crowding out a local market. Um, they're also connected to the collapse of national textile industries historically and having that waste and environmental impact as well. In the EPZ's uh, angle, we see both the, the positives of the cost benefits to companies and the economic development opportunities for the, the, the African state, um, but also the acknowledgement of unsustainable and exploitative production that needs quite uh, stri strict regulation. From the African designers' perspective, we, we see, yes, that, that negative impacts of the mass production generating waste and the, the issues around um, prioritisation of, of foreign interest, uh, limited kind of uh, domestic um, capacity building uh, in terms of higher value activity, but also drawing out some of the nuances there in terms of the potential positive production linkages that could be facilitated, um, the both the use of of waste stream materials, um, providing input variety consistently and offering a degree of circularity, um, but also the potential for, for designers to maybe engage more effectively with this manufacturing infrastructure. So to conclude, our, our paper is sought to highlight the duality and tensions between local cultural foundations for sustainable or circular, as we might refer it fashion, and the impact of global market forces. This is a narrative we've sought to, to offer, which affords greater agency to African cultural producers and considers the African fashion industry as a site of opportunity and demonstrating leadership potential. So on the one side, we're placing cultural values and, and inputs that are very much place-based that characterise these designers' working practices. In, and we're positioning that on the other side with global production and market decisions that affect their business models and operations. And we argue in this paper that to critically understand the global dynamics and geographies of the circular economy development, it is really important to explore these two dimensions together. Thank you very much for listening. The full paper of, uh, of this uh, talk is available open access in the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Society. Uh, the full citation is there uh, and you can also find it linked through from our social media accounts and the website. Thank you very much and I hope you've enjoyed listening to the presentations at this conference.